In the second part of Lesson 7, we will continue our discussion and analysis of St. John Damascene's De Fide Orthodoxa, looking especially at and focusing upon the union of the natures in the one incarnation, the union of the divine and human nature in the one incarnation, and also giving special attention to the fact that because there are two natures, there are two essential energies and two essential properties <clears throat> which then manifest themselves in terms of two natural wills in Christ. And thus this is a continuation of the Damascene's articulation especially and reception especially of Saint Maximus the Confessor pinpointing and unfolding for us the uniqueness in Christ insofar as he has two natural wills, one divine and human, on the one hand, thus uniting Christ with us against the Monophysites and the Monothelites, yet also affirming on the other hand that because Christ is God and in his human nature, in his incarnation, that human nature is not only assumed, it is also united with the word and thus deified through the divine energies that Christ himself in his will is perfect thus he doesn't he's not given over to deliberation to opinion and then to judgment rather Christ because of his perfect knowledge does not make judgments but rather immediately and intuitively perceives the truth of a given situation and always makes an infallibly certain and perfect decision. And this, St. Maximus says, while on the one hand Christ shares with us, us a natural will and the power of willing, he does not share with us what is called the thelema gnomicon, that is, the will of opinion or the will of judgment. Judgment and opinion are the effects of ignorance, whereas Christ was all-knowing. Christ was not ignorant. And so let us proceed then on to this brief analysis and commentary on the De Fide Orthodoxa, Book 3, Chapters 9, and then 11 through 16. First of all, and it must be noted, that nature, any real existent nature, necessarily has subsistence. And essence, when we're talking about a rational essence, must terminate, that must, that must, that, that is, it must result in a person, a hypostasis. However, the Damascene notes that natures in and of themselves, created natures in and of themselves, imply no necessity that that nature have its own subsistence. Thus, any created nature is potentially open to subsisting not in a created subsistence but in an uncreated subsistence and in the case of Christ because man is the crown of creation it is most fitting that man would then be assumed as a rational being be assumed and then subsist in a divine person if God chose to communicate himself and to unite himself personally with creation. So thus, the claim that any real existent nature necessarily has subsistence is a generic claim. All natures, for them to be, that is, for them to exist, must have subsistence. But there is no requirement on the part of the nature that the subsistence be in itself, that is, independent. Rather, the subsistence can come from a higher being, that is, a divine being. So then the claim of, the, the claim of <clears throat> every nature having a subsistence is a generic claim and not a specific claim. It doesn't identify the mode of subsistence, the termination of the person or in the person of any given nature. <clears throat> the 
The Damascene also says that nature or species can be thought of as thought of in three three ways. That is abs abstractly. That is in thought. That is a pure figment of the imagination. When I imagine the species of a dog in my mind, that species of a dog has some existence in my mind, but it doesn't have any substantial or subsistent existence. And so it can be a pure figment. <clears throat> a figment, however, that derives and is corresponding to an external reality. Second, a nature or a species or an eidos in Greek can be thought of as in common. That is what all dogs share in virtue of their dogness. There's a common nature that is a bond of union, an objective, real bond of union be between each individual dog. And then finally, a species can be thought of individually. That is, as subsistent, as a substantial being, a subsisting being, having accidents, but yet identical in species. And this identity in species would then recur back to that commonality, that common species or nature that serves as the bond of union. And the individuation then comes through the unique particularities that redound to the subsistence in terms of accidents, in terms of that unique existence. So the incarnation then was not the assumption of an abstract human species because an abstraction would just be the assumption of an idea. Well, God already has all the species in a more real sense than whatever would fit or correspond to our own concepts. And thus, there would be no assumption if it were just the assumption of an abstract figment of the mind. No, the incarnation was of the species. It was of the common nature as individual and thus real. So the incarnation was of an individual human man, thus an individual human nature, however that nature being identical or in common with all other human beings. <clears throat> and so thus we can say that the incarnation was an individual man, but the man can be then predicated in common with all other men and women, anyone who shares human nature. And then finally, the union, there's a distinction he wants to make that should be noted as union is truly spoken of with respect to the divine and human nature. But union doesn't signify the manner in which or that in which the, the conjunction or coming together of the two distinct item occurs. So union signifies the conjunction of two entities, divine and human. But incarnation clarifies that it was in human flesh terminating in the person of the word that this union is brought about. So union is a more generic term and incarnation specifies what exactly and in what and in which the union consists, divine and human in the person of the word. So if the incarnation is of a divine person, then we can say that if this is a divine person, I'm, but yet human, he must in some way descend from Adam. Otherwise, if he came straight from heaven, he wouldn't share Adam's nature in terms of lineal or genealogical descent. He would be a different entity. He would be a different species because not sharing that common filiation with Adam. So if there is going to be an incarnation of a human nature, the incarnation of the word in human nature, this posits there must be a mother. And this is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Mother, the, the Panagia Mediatris, the Theotokos. And the Damascene against the Nestorians is very firm on this point that Mary the Virgin is in strict truth the God-bearer. Thus we can say that the Word, the divine person of the Word begotten timelessly by the Father in accordance with his person and his divine nature also took flesh 
uniquely and miraculously from the Virgin. This means he did not come as a man and pass through the woman as through uh, a channel or some sort of conduit, nor did he come through come from heaven bodily, nor did he take flesh in terms of what we talked about in the first weeks, a manifestation, meaning or 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 an apparition. Thinking of the lives of the prophets and the saints, God working in and through those men, through Moses as a prophet, though the word through the Spirit coming upon Moses so that he can be a prophet of the people of Israel and to lead them out of Egypt into the promised land, although not quite making it into the promised land. Nor was he an apparition such as the vision of Moses on the mountain of the burning bush. No, rather he literally took flesh. The divine person of the word literally took flesh from the virgin, solely from the virgin, without any part or participation by a human man. This harkens back to that vision in the prophet Daniel where it speaks of the rock being hewn from the mountain, not cut, however, by human hands and growing up into a giant mountain itself and crushing the empires that are signified through the <clears throat> four-level statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. No, the incarnate word took flesh uniquely from the virgin. And so we can truly say that the word begotten in accordance with the divinity terminating in a divine person, that same person also, according to human nature, was truly begotten of the woman. And thus there are two generations, the Damascene says, we reverence the two generations of the word, the divine and the human, from the father, from or by the Theotokos. And thus we, can, we have an instance that there are two filiations. We can say that the father is the natural father of the son according to divine nature, and the mother is the natural mother of the son according to human nature. And in this sense, the East is much clearer than the majority of the Latin scholastic West because it recognizes that filiation and thus natural sonship is predicated not primarily in terms of person, but in terms of nature. The father communicates his nature to the son. The mother communicates her nature to the same son. Thus, natural filiation in two modes. On this score, SCOTUS is unique amongst the great Western scholastics in recognizing the dual filiation. Bonaventure and Aquinas, however, because they predicate filiation, thus natural sonship, to the person, can only ever say that Mary is not the natural mother, or rather Christ is not the natural son of Mary because they predicate or locate or explain filiation and thus generation, ultimately, in terms of personhood. So, by virtue of Mary giving birth to a divine person, so Bonaventure and Aquinas, she is not the natural mother of the word incarnate. But, if you follow Scotus in the Damascene, affirming the two generations, the two begottenness, then we can find that Mary is the natural mother to the word incarnate, and the father is the natural father to the word incarnate incarnate as well in virtue of the two natures <clears throat> going on then the Damascene makes a clear apologetic and even polemical move in refuting Nestorius calling him even a Judaizer he says that Mary the Virgin Mary should never be called Christotokos but only Theotokos and this is really in effect to preserve the fact that Mary is uniquely the mother of the one divine person, the, the whole Christ, and not merely can be shunted off in a quasi-Nestorian way, saying Mary gave birth to the human nature, but not to the person. No, Mary gave birth to a person in virtue of giving birth to the nature that subsisted in the person. Of course, she didn't generate the person eternally, but she truly is mother of that person 
who is God in accordance with human nature. Thus we call her Theotokos, the God-bearer, and not merely Christotokos, the Christ-bearer. Because many people can be called Christ. Paul says himself in Galatians that we are to bear Christ in ourselves. A saintly man can be called Christ in virtue of his conformity and his perfection in and participation in and through the divine energies and in virtue of this process of divinization. So the Damascene wants to affirm that only Mary and Mary can only be called Theotokos because all of us are called to bear Christ in ourselves and to bring forth Christ in our souls. And so what are the three then effects in our nature, meaning the assumed nature of Jesus Christ, the assumed human nature of Jesus Christ? It has three simultaneous effects. The first is the assumption of an individual human nature to the divine word, meaning this human nature, though possessing all of its natural powers, faculties, and energies and operations, this human nature doesn't exist in virtue of itself. It is not independent. It rather subsists in the person of the word. Thus, its existence, its subsistent existence, is in virtue of its dependence upon the person of the word. Thus, it's a divine person. The second is, is in this very act of assumption, simultaneously, existence itself was given to the human nature. Thus, we cannot say that the human nature pre-existed and was then assumed, or that um, the human nature was assumed and then came into existence. No, upon the very moment of the assumption, that human nature, that human nature of Jesus Christ, the man-god, came into existence. And then finally, in virtue of the dignity of being a divine person and the circumincessant life, this penetration of our human nature to an unimaginable degree of perfection, the human nature of Christ was deified. That means the human nature was brought to its full capacity to know and to love God and to know and to love what God reveals for us to know and to love. Thus we can say in the very instance of the instant of the union and incarnation, our Lord's human nature was perfectly deified. And then finally, what follows from this is if Mary is Theotokos, if Mary gave Christ uniquely her own pure flesh from her own pure blood, so that Christ is truly consubstantial, then Mary, in giving birth with to the assumed the existing and deified God-man, she is the mother of the assumption of human nature, the existence of the God-man, and the deification of the human nature. Therefore, if it is in virtue of the deification of human nature that Christ sends his Holy Spirit, then Mary is the mother of this deification and sending of the Holy Spirit. She is the mother of Christ, in his natural body and also Christ in his mystical body. Therefore, it follows in virtue of her unique cooperation with the Holy Spirit and the Father in bringing forth substantially the God-man. She is also then mediatress of grace in terms of giving birth to deification itself, to deified humanity itself, and thus is therefore the unique cooperator in both the redemption of man, that is, the cleansing of sin, the rectifying of the passions, the ordering of the, the mind and the passions to the, to, the, to the intellect and will, and also of salvation itself, meaning perfect divinization or deification and resurrected life at the right hand of the Son who sits at the right hand of the Father. And from this, this, this is the essential foundation. Theotokos is the reason why Mary was pre-purified, immaculate. She was pre-purified because she is Theotokos, and in Theotokos she is the mother of the assumption, the existence, and the deification of the human nature of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in virtue of his mediatory action, she therefore is mediatrix 
and unique cooperator in redemption and salvation. And if you understand these points, the the later Latin scholastic debates about declaring Our Lady as mediatrix of all grace and co-redemptrix become much more innocuous. No, Mary is all of this properly understood because she is the Immaculate Theotokos, the Panagia, God-bearer. And so from an Eastern perspective, right out of the pages of the Damascene, and the Damascene himself building upon the legacy of St. Maximus the Confessor and the Cappadocians, especially Gregory of Nazianzus, we find that all of the essential core truths that are contained in calling Our Lady Mediatrix and Co-Redemptrix is situated and in virtue of Our Lady being already Theotokos and all that that implies with respect to the bringing forth of the God-man deified from the first moment of the existence of his human nature. So from this fact of union and incarnation, we have to then posit that in each nature, that nature will possess the fullness of its properties. This simply follows from the logic of union and incarnation. If there is a union of two natures and the incarnation posits that a human nature in all of its, a full human nature is assumed and given existence and subsisting in the person of the word, then that human nature must have all the natural properties of human nature and the word in virtue of it being a divine person that word must also have all the natural properties of the divine nature so Christ is like the Father in all except unbegottenness because unbegottenness is a personal property of the Father it doesn't imply any essential perfection of the divinity it rather implies the source of the Godhead itself in the Father's unbegottenness thus in so much as the Father is unbegotten, he can communicate the divine being to the Word and to the Spirit. And the Word then, the personal property of the Word, is sonship. So in this sense then, our Lord is like the Father in all except unbegottenness. And on the flip side, in his incarnation, he is like Adam in all save sin. This is an interesting point, hearkening back to our previous uh, lesson on the original sin. Because what St. John Damascene is doing here is in Adam we all fell because we suffer the consequences of the loss of, of grace and glory, the loss of communion, the, the um, introduction of corruption and death. But Adam's sin is a hypostatic property. It's not a natural property. It redounds to Adam uniquely because through his hypostasis, Adam in his personal uniqueness chose to use his na nature in a sinful way. Thus, sin becomes a quasi, it becomes attributable to Adam's hypostasis and thus cannot be attributed to Christ. He is like Adam in all save sin, both in its effects and in its commission. And we are like Adam in so much as we suffer the consequences of sin, the loss of grace and fellowship, and in so far as we are to, we ourselves also sin freely, thus resulting in our own deaths. <clears throat> and so if there then are two natures, there are two sets of qualities, divine human, two volitions, two energies, and two wisdoms and two knowledges. There's the divine and human, this fundamental disjunct between created and uncreated, and in our Lord because he, in his one unique and incommunicable person, has both divine and human nature, he then uniquely has fully divinity and fully humanity in his will, his energy, his wisdom and knowledge. And thus we can in terms of the two natures, we can refute monoph monophysitism and monothelitism. In having a full human nature with a full set of human qualities, this rules out monophysitism. And having, in virtue of quality and nature, volition and energy rules out monothelitism on the one hand. 
And then on the other hand, it might be added that in virtue of the one hypostatic, the one compound hypostasis, it rules out Nestorianism because you have both natures, divine and human, ter terminating in one person, not in two distinct subsistences, implying two distinct persons, one divine and one human. <clears throat> then finally, excuse me, not finally, but in virtue of, of the dual natures, then we can say that Christ truly has two wills and two freedoms. This is because he has two natural wills and energies, but one hypostasis, that is, one single person, thus implying the unity without separation in the distinction of the natural will and energy and the, of the natural created will and energy and the natural divine will and uncreated divine energy. <clears throat> so from the sameness, we can infer unity. Thus, in the Trinity, we see an identity of energy and power in the one divine essence. Thus, we can say any manifest then in each person. Thus, we can say that each person simply is the divine being. We derive there, there, thereby from the sameness of energy, the sameness of being or nature. And, on the, and then in Christ, then, the difference of natures can be discerned from a difference in energy. That is, insofar as Christ manifests the divine energy, we realize that he's identical with the divine being in his person. And insofar as Christ manifests human ener energies, we can discern that he is identical with humanity, thus having human nature. However, and this is an important part, and this is where we get into some of the key distinctions of, uh, that, that flowed out of the debates over monothelitism. Uh, St. Maximus, uh, Lateran 649, and so on. <clears throat> the faculty, the natural faculty, which pertains and follows from nature is not the same as the manner in which that faculty is used and employed. In one sense, then, we can say that the faculty itself or the power itself is in virtue of a nature, but the use of that faculty or the, 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 the mode of that faculty's employment is in virtue of the hypostasis. The hypostasis determines how the faculties are used. So on the one hand, we can say will is a natural property, a natural property of human nature, because it's an essential property. And it's not learned. No one learns to will. The will operates on its own, and we, in a sense, learn by willing. Willing is a natural activity manifested in its energetic functions of human nature. Also, then, willing as an action rather than as a power is with respect to a given object. And so there's a distinction that we made earlier. In the will as a as a power, it's ordered towards, by nature, ordered towards the good in conformity with the divine will. That's its natural end. That's its natural disposition. However, in any given instance of willing, that willing will be with reference to a particular object. So thus there's the distinction we made earlier between first act, the will as a power and a faculty, a disposition, and second act, the will in action through a given hypostasis, or in virtue of a hypostasis, rather, acting through that will with respect to a particular and contingent object. Moreover, if, if the will isn't affirmed to be a natural property, the only other possibility would that it would be a hypostatic property. But if you affirm that, that it's a hypostatic property, crazy consequences would follow with respect to both God and man. On the one hand, then, if we affirm that the will in the Godhead was a hypostatic property, then we could say that the Father has a will that's unique to his hypostasis, and that is dis distinct from the Son's will. So thus we would end up with three or perhaps four wills in the Godhead, distinct wills, which would completely destroy the unity of the Godhead. Moreover, you would be attributing certain powers and faculties to a hypostasis, while the hypostasis doesn't imply, ipso facto, any kind of essential perfection other than 
the essential perfections that redound upon the hypostasis because it's the termination of a given kind of will. And, in, and then, on the other hand, with respect to man, if we say that the will is a hypostatic property, well, then we would must say then that the will of Peter is essentially different than the will of Paul. And if Christ assumes human nature, then Christ would be bringing what? A divine will in relation to the wills of Peter and Paul? And then what would be, what would be assumed in common with respect to the most important faculty, that faculty by which we are blamed or praised, what would be assumed in common if that were the case? And then finally, since Adam sinned in will, granted that the will is a natural faculty, if the will was not assumed in Christ, the first wound of human nature would not have been assumed. And thus, as St. Athanasius says, if the first wound in human nature was not assumed and corrected and deified, well, then there would be no divinization or deification at all. So on the one hand, then, um, <clears throat> we can say that the unity in Christ is preserved in the hypostasis, and the difference is manifested in the nature acting in accordance or manifesting itself in terms of natural energies. So then we can, so we can further distinguish, then, given what we've already said, that the will seems to have three moments. It seems to have the first moment as a natural power, that is a natural power disposed by nature to the good, but it's a natural power that is inherently free and spontaneous. That is, it is not dominated by necessity, and by necessity I mean a necessity of coaction or violence, that which determines the will from without. So the will is naturally disposed towards the good, but in its disposition and in its activity, its essential mode is free. So the nature of the will is not free. The nature of the will is just simply disposed towards the good, but in the activity of the will, in its energetic manifestation, the will must act in, an, in, an, in, an <clears throat> in accordance with a free manner. Secondly, then, willing can include, then, a particular will act, that is, and in, include del deliberation, forming an opinion, making, an making a judgment about something. And this is what uh, Maximus, the confessor, and the Damascene follow following him, called the Thelema Gnomicum. And this is the will of opinion, or the will of judgment. And because Christ was not ignorant, because, remember, in the Incarnation, in that moment of assumption and existence, he was fully deified. He did not have a, a, have a will based or deriving from deliberation, opinion, and judgment. He made perfect decisions from the very beginning. He did not exercise or have a gnomic will. And thus we can say that although Christ was like us in having a perfectly free natural will and in his acts of choice being perfectly free in those, he did not share with us a gnomic will or a gnomic will because simply he wasn't ignorant. And so in the fall, nature was in a sense oriented away from its natural end. I'm speaking specifically in the will. And so in a sense nature functioned in an unnatural way. But the nature itself was preserved, the, the image was preserved, that is Man is a rational entity, sharing with the Father freedom, knowledge, and volition. However, it was only in the incarnation, in the assumption of a perfect will, that A, the perfection of the created will in making choice in perfect freedom, perfect knowledge, and perfect correspondence with the will of God was rendered actual in Christ, and in human nature, in virtue of Christ, and possible to all of human nature through ascesis, through purgation, illumination, ultimately ending in union or a perfect likeness. So the image was turned away from the likeness, but in Christ the image was reunited with the likeness, because in Christ 
perfect freedom was united with perfect knowledge and perfect choice. And so the natural was reoriented to the natural in so much as Christ reoriented human nature back in the direction of, of, of its creator, the Father. <clears throat> so if our Lord had two natural, two natures, two qualities, two operations, he also had two natural energies. This just simply follows from the fact that the Lord has two natures, and as a nature can't really exist without a subsistence, so also a nature can't ex exist without manifesting its energies. So the Lord had two energies, one that flowed from his consubstantiality with the Father, and the other his consubstantiality with the Virgin, and by extension the rest of us. However, unlike unlike subs subsistence or nature and subsistence an energy must manifest its nature so although a nature can subsist in a subsistence not its own namely a divine subsistence an energy must manifest its nature or power and so in Christ, then, we find that in virtue of the manifestation of the divine energies, the distinct, the divine and human energies, we find that there must be a distinction in nature, a difference in nature. And in this difference in nature, we find that one is human, one is divine. So we reason back from the manifestation of the divine and human energies to the realization of the distinction of natures and the the, the, the single divine subsistence. So how then would the divine energies be manifested? It's, it's not exactly clear um, how this would happen. But the Damascene um, gives us some guidance. In the first place, the divine energies are manifest through miracles, especially three key miracles, the virgin birth, the transfiguration, and the resurrection. Moreover, these realities in concert or in comparison with Christ's own supernatural knowledge and the claims he made about himself and his relation to the Father. So in some sense then we can recognize the uncreated divine energies through the virgin birth, through the transfiguration especially, and then realized and consummated in the resurrection. And then how does he manifest his human energies? Well, by his human activities. That's fairly obvious. So in Christ operating and living like a human being, he's manifesting his human energies, thus his human nature. So in Christ, there are two natural energies. Then a further question arises, though. Are there really only two natural energies, or are there three in Christ? And this, this question arises just from a simple philosophical mistake, which simply flows, flows from the fact that one must recognize that a compound nature, that is, a human nature composed of two substances, body and soul, that compound nature is not identical to its components, and you don't name the compound nature, that is human nature, in virtue of its components, just as you wouldn't name the body in virtue of its elemental components of, 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 of carbon um, and, and oxygen. So you wouldn't, you would you, you call it a body. You wouldn't call it carbon oxygen and say that the body has two energies of, of, of carbon and oxygen etc um, <clears throat> and so in this in this 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 is a simple mistake is that because there are two substances soul and body that converge or come together to form one compound substance it doesn't follow that that compound substance is two anymore no it's one it's one composed of two and so that one is manifesting one energy the human energy 
So thus, a single nature is named from the essence as essentially compound and not from its component parts. And in the Lord's case, finally, though there is an energy of the body and the soul, both are single in the one human nature. Because the human nature is the point of reference by which we name human energies. How, moreover, however, this human nature is united to the word and insofar as it is united to the word, its energies are attributed to the person of the word, but explained in virtue of the created human nature. On the other, on the other hand, the divine nature also manifests its energies, as uh, we sp we spoke before. And the divine essence or the divine being is infinite, simple, uncompound, as uh, the Damascene says. So thus, we have two natures and not three. Quite a simple elementary philosophical error, but it's something that can continue to arise by people who fail to distinguish again between nature and person on the one hand, and then also elements and their compounds on the other.